Welcome everyone. Hello, hello. Welcome to this Adobe live stream. Let's make sure we're up and running. And we are now. All right. Awesome. There we go. Okay, just making sure the stream started. Sorry about the delay, everyone. Uh, my name is Terry White, worldwide designer and photography evangelist for Adobe. It's my pleasure to be streaming to you live here uh, at, on, the, on Creative Cloud and streaming specifically about Adobe stock. For those of you, I'll wait a few seconds for people to pile in, but while I'm waiting, I can explain a couple things for the people that are here on time, and that is that this is going to be a really three-part stream. It's going to happen uh, over the next three weeks, starting today. Uh, so we, we thought we would get people going on, a, on contributing to Adobe Stock. And one of the ways of doing that, of course, is showing them and teaching them uh, not only how to do it, but what methods work best. So let me get my chat window open here. Cool. Hey, Trent, what's going on? Hey, I thought I saw, saw Victoria pop in there as well. And hello, Australia. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, Levi um, and everyone else in the chat. And thanks for the comments about the tutorial. And hello, France. All right. So with that said, uh, let's not keep you too long. Let's uh, jump right in and, and talk about the topic at hand. One thing you'll notice behind me is I have some samples from Adobe Stock. And these samples that are behind me, which we'll go into more detail in just a few moments, uh, these samples are... Have, they all have one thing in, in common. They're not by the same photographer. They're not all taken in the same place on the same day or the same subject. But what they have in common is that they're all best sellers. What that means is in the last, I think most of these were best sellers from, what are we in now, April? Best sellers from March. A few of these are best sellers from April. But what I mean by that is they were best sellers at the time I put them up uh, or grabbed them of the month. And they're best sellers for a reason. And we're going to kind of go through that in this first part. What makes a good stock photo? Now, when you think about stock photography, and let's back up a little bit and kind of cover the whole thing of why we're doing this three-part series, is as you may know, or you should know by now, that Adobe has a, 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 a offering called Adobe Stock. And that offering for our customers is so that they can, while they're right into products, your favorite products, Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign, Muse, Premiere, After Effects, so forth and so on, they could actually go to their CC library, do a search for a stock piece of content, because it could be a video as well as an image, graphic design, or a photo, search for the ones they, they search for the keywords that they're looking for, find some results, pick the one they like, and literally drag it right in to their um, concept or to the work that they're working on. So that offers a huge advantage uh, for people that are working with stock photography to be able to license it and grab it right while they're in the midst of the design process. How, now, how does that help you as the photographer, graphic designer, videographer, or content creator? If you contribute your work to Adobe Stock, you not only get to be put in the forefront of those customers looking for content, but you get to make money to, money from it. You get to make royalties from it. And what I like to say is Adobe Stock is one of the best ways to make money while you sleep. Because once you upload that great content, it can continue to sell over and over and over again from the day, from the day it's approved. So with that said, let's talk about, for people, this is kind of a basics getting started. Let's talk about what makes a good stock photo. So um, I'm going to pop over to my computer and on my computer, I've actually got a blog post up. And this blog post is seven tips uh, to be successful or uh, create better photos for Adobe Stock in the first place. Now, so this is taking into account the photography process, the ability to actually go out and shoot the content in the first place. Um, and this was done by one of the, uh, I believe one of the Adobe Stock contributors in the first place. So uh, before I scroll down, one of the things that's kind of a given is that we expect you to, or anyone expects you to kind of take a technically correct photo. And what I mean by that being technically correct, 
a photo that's in focus, a photo that has enough resolution, a photo that um, has enough exposure, um, you know, not blown out highlights, not blurry, not noisy, so forth and so on. So those are kind of the technical aspects that I consider the ground level. Those are the things that I wouldn't even begin to, to submit something to stock if it didn't at least meet that minimum criteria. After that, then we start getting into, okay, we met the baseline criteria of it's a technically good photo, but is it a good photo for stock? So let's go through um, the top seven here, and then I'll show you some examples uh, that I pulled from the, uh, the best of the month, so to speak. So first and foremost, pick the right subject. Uh, if you are an animal um, lover or a pet owner, chances are you have dozens, if not hundreds or thousands of images of your pet. And while your pet is the cutest pet in the world to you, because pets are so easy to photograph, in most cases, we get literally tens of thousands, if not more, maybe even millions of submissions of pet photos. So there's nothing stopping you from submitting a pet photo. But you got to remember that if you start off doing submitting pet photos, that pet photo has to be killer. It has to be exceptional. It has to be leaps and bounds over just your dog sitting in a corner while you snap the what I call a snapshot of it. So while the snapshot might be technically correct, you're competing against some of the best pet photos in the world. And while your pet is cute and maybe even unique, it would have to be over and above what's already there to make a difference, so to speak. So if you look at these examples, these are great because they take into account not only cute pets, in this case cats, but cats doing maybe interesting things or from interesting angles or perspectives. So that would be one thing to, to consider. Pick the right subject. Um, submit ex uh, exceptional, unique content. So this is what I was getting at is, you know, not just the pet picture, but the pet being in, in a situation or an exceptional situation that would make a good stock photo. So you can see the ones here, uh, photos taken of um, children doing in, in, in exceptional um, lighting and locations and in many cases going about their daily life in, in the case of this being a lifestyle shoot. But just if you think about that, you look at those pictures and you say, wow, I would love to use one of those pictures in maybe a brochure or design because it's an exceptional piece of content. Uh, the next one. Now this gets into some of the technical stuff, but just some reminders. Check for overall composition because you got to remember what might make a good snapshot to post on Instagram. It may not be composed the best way to be a good stock photo. And what I mean by that is over the years, being a portrait photographer, I have always, um, or for the most part, have tightly cropped my photos, meaning cropping right, right to the face or even cutting out part of the head intentionally and cropping and keeping the photo tight. That makes a good looking portrait, but that doesn't necessarily make a good looking stock photo. For example, if you crop to the shoulders or if you crop the, or the shoulders off partly, then that means if someone wants to use that photo, They've got to put it up against a corner or make sure that the it fills the page because they don't want half a shoulder missing. So in the case of a stock photo, I'd probably show the I'd probably back up a little bit and show the entire person's um, um, body in the case of not cropping parts off because that would make a better stock photo. In the case of this landscape, you can see the one on the left with the sloping horizon that people really don't like sloping horizons. You may be doing that on purpose, you may be doing it by accident, but level the horizon if you're gonna submit it to stock. Because technically, from a stock perspective, that would be the better way. Make your images look their best. So again, while you may have shot um, a great photo in a great location, if you just take it right out of the camera and don't do any post-processing, it may not look the best. Especially, for example, if you're shooting in RAW. If you're shooting in RAW, then chances are your photos are going to have a more of a flat look to them because that's traditionally how RAW looks until you enhance it, until you make it, or until you process it, I should say, to make it look the way it really looked when you were on the scene. So in this top example, the photo is a little too cool with the white balance. Here it's a little too warm, and that's more of a balanced photo. And also you'll notice that 
giving it some more space, not cropping tight on the, on the family there. Uh, overexposed photos, dead giveaway that, you know, it, you know, if I'm looking at this shot um, and I'm looking for that church, wherever that church is, and there were other versions of that church taken by other photographers or you, I'm probably not going to go with the one with the blown out highlights or the one that's underexposed. So again, getting it technically correct. Same thing with contrast and same thing with saturation. You look at the uh, orange in this photo. Orange is kind of dull versus here. It looks a lot more vibrant. So people are ten tend to look for those kinds of things in their photos. Now, if you shoot high ISO, uh, because you're trying to get the um, a good amount of light in, because you're not using artificial lighting, then your chances are you're going to have noise in your photo. And that's just the nature of digital photography. So at that point, then you might want to uh, correct for that noise using, for example, something like Camera Raw or Lightroom. And uh, this one has bitten me a couple of times, and that is, uh, this. you see this green halo? That green halo is actually um, chromatic aberration. It's, it's when the lens doesn't focus proper, properly on all the light sources that are coming into the camera, and you end up literally with a green halo around your image. That's a one-click fix inside of Lightroom and uh, Camera Raw to remove it. And if you don't zoom in, and that's what this really is saying, zoom in to 100% to make sure that your photos look good all the way around. Um, if you don't zoom in, chances are you will not see it. Now, in this case, uh, out of focus, that will not only not be a good stock photo, but that will probably get declined because out of focus is one of those things that we, we don't want a bunch of out of focus stock photos. So um, make sure the focus is tight. That's why you're usually going to take more than one shot to begin with, just in case you can't see it on that small LCD screen um, and you, you want to make sure that the images are in focus. And sharpening this, I could sharpen this all day long, that's not going to bring it back into focus. So uh, sharpening is not a substitute for um, correcting or shooting proper focus in the first place. And last but not least, in this particular blog post, be aware of intellectual property laws and trademarks. Um, I remember staging a, a photo shoot for uh, like in an office environment and I had an iPad, which was off, laying on the desk next to the subject, just laying there. And it got declined because, not because you could see an Apple logo, but because you're all, you could tell that was an iPad. It's like I can look at that by that center button that's most likely an iPhone. So if, it, if it's intellectual property and you don't have the rights to photograph that and sell it, then um, it might get declined. Now, how could, it, how could you correct for this? Go into Photoshop and clone out that button or um, Content Aware fill that button out so it doesn't appear. So it's just one black slate phone. Now it doesn't look like an iPhone because it doesn't have the center button. So that would actually get you um, more likely to be approved than leaving that button in place. All right, uh, what do you do when you wanted a dreamy kind of look that lends itself to being blurry? Well, I think, Trisha, what you're referring to is depth of field, and depth of field is okay because that's the background being blurry. If the subject or the entire photo is being blurry, then that's kind of going to look like it's out of focus and probably get declined. Now, there's nothing stopping you from putting a note in to the moderator saying, hey, I created this dreamy look on purpose. Uh, can you please accept this image the way it is? And um, they may, depending on how dreamy <laughs> or how out of focus it is, they may agree with you and go ahead and accept it. But that is totally between you and the moderator at that point. Um, and I say moderator, but the person who approves the photos um, to see if they feel like it really is out of focus or you created an effect. Okay, so with that said, um, copyrighted artwork, so shooting pictures of, of copyrighted paintings or statues or whatever could be the best photo in the world, but if it's not your work, then chances are it's going to be declined. Recognizable buildings uh, could also get, be a gotcha. I remember taking a photo of the Seattle skyline at night. Beautiful image, totally in focus, long exposure, looked great. Beautiful skyline with the space needle right in the front. Declined because I don't have the rights to sell the intellectual property of the Space Needle. 
and it was literally right in the center of the photo. So that became the focus of the photo. Now there are some times where that is okay, where it's not the focus, not the primary focus of the image. You're shooting a skyline and that thing that's copyrighted is off to the side and small and in the lower left corner, kind of can't avoid it. That might be okay, but if it's right in the middle and the primary subject of the photo, then that won't be okay. All right, so um, Regina's asking on Facebook, do I need a model release if it contains other people? You absolutely do. So let's pop over to Photoshop. And in Photoshop, um, I have some examples here uh, from Note. Remember I mentioned earlier the best-selling photos and let, let's for the month. So let's talk about one of this one in particular, then I'll get to your people question. Um, Adobe Jason, what's up, man? I didn't know you were Adobe Jason on Facebook. You know he's cool when it, it's Adobe Jason. All right, so what's going on, man? Uh, so uh, this particular photo, the reason that it's a good seller is not because it's just a gorgeous photo with gorgeous light. It's a good selling photo because it can be used multiple different ways. And when you're when you're going out to create content about and Kruger's asking about faces in a large crowd. So let me get to faces in just a second. When you're um, when you're looking at a photo and you say to yourself from a marketing standpoint, from a person that might buy this photo, what could they use it for? And if multiple things come to mind, multiple totally different topics come to mind, then you're on to something. So for example, you look at this photo and you say, well, this could be used for growth. It could be used for good morning. It could be used for farming. It could be used for uh, a lot of things, a lot of different subjects that come to mind. Greenery, um, the environment. If you start thinking of it that way, then you're on to something. Let's get to the people part of this. And let's talk about, for example, this photo. Five kids. <clears throat> It required five model releases and because they're kids it required five model releases signed by the photographer the parent hopefully both parents because that makes it easier because the third signature you need is a witness signature so even if you you're the photographer the mom or dad's there they sign off on it you still need a third person to sign off on it that witnesses the signature of you and the and the photographer. So yes, you absolutely need a model release if it's a recognizable face. So for the person that asks, well, what about if it's a crowd of people? You know, it's a, it's a bunch of people walking towards me and I, I start photographing. If I can recognize the faces in those shots and you don't have the model releases for them, they're gonna all be declined. So yes, even a crowd of people. So in what people have tend to tend to do is they um, either use depth of field to make the focus the, the faces out of focus, or they do a common thing that I'm seeing more and more of. Let me see if I got a better example here. I saw one example below, but uh, oh, actually, I see a couple of examples. So they'll do one of two things. You cannot show the faces. Gets the point across, I, I'm guessing they're having a business meeting. And that would make a great stock photo for a business meeting. Matter of fact, it must make a great stock photo because it's one of the best sellers of the month. Um, and I don't need a model release for this one because I'm not showing any recognizable faces. Or that approach, no recognizable faces, therefore no model releases needed. So someone's saying, um, Need or not, a photo was taken about public places or public copyright does not apply. Um, well, Miko, the, the, he's talking about the skyline or the um, Space Needle photo. It does apply because if Adobe's always going to err on the can we be sued for this? And if the answer is yes, <laughs> then they're going to uh, um, decline the image. So, while you and I may agree, may not agree that, hey, this shouldn't have been declined, it's kind of the whole skyline, and yeah, the Space Needle's there, but it's part of Seattle, why not? You're not an internet, I'm gonna guess you're not an intellectual property lawyer, or neither am I, and it's better to err on the side of 
avoid the lawsuit versus, hey, bring it on. So that's why it's going to get declined. Um, all right, let's go here. I think I saw a couple more questions here on Facebook. Let me go down. All right, I see the Facebook moderators jumping right in. Okay, so if not if it's not okay to shoot the Apple products, but everything else is okay if the logo is removed. Um, again, it depends on the product. If we can recognize the product because it has a distinctive shape, look, design, then photoshopping off the logo or removing the logo may not be enough. It would all just depend on the actual image. Because certain things from the front, back, or side, you know what it is. You know who made it because they have a distinctive um, they have a distinctive shape to them. So therefore, e even though the logo is not there and even though I don't see the front of it, I know what it is and therefore that could be declined. All right, let's get back to uh, the topic at hand, what makes a great stock photo. So I already started down that path with one of them, one that, uh, that can be used for multiple purposes. The other thing that sells very well, sorry about that, the other thing that sells very well, photos with people. Um, and if you think about it from this perspective, people, first of all, are unique. Um, most people that are being photographed for stock are usually not being photographed by hundreds of different photographers for stock. So that person, that, that girl, that, that guy, they're unique probably to stock. I probably will not find too many different pictures of them unless they're by the same photographer. So if I like their look, then I'm more likely to want to license this image or I like the setting they're in and their look. I'm more likely to license it. Um, and so editorial is totally different, Anna. Let me get to that in a few seconds. Uh, so in this case, that, that's what's making this a great stock photo. It's warm, people, happy, family oriented. They're doing something. They're not just standing there looking at the camera. And all of that plays into why this is probably a popular photo. Uh, so anytime you've got people enjoying themselves, people having fun, people happy, people smiling, even though she's holding a tablet, I can't tell what tablet that is from the side. It might be an iPad, it might not be. You start to see the point. Out of focus background, no problem, because that's simply depth of field. She's in focus. So again, another example of a great stock photo. Um, photos that convey emotion. So she's not smiling, but we get it. She's having a bad day, headache. Um, could be used for illustrating a bad day. Could be used for, I'm having a headache. Could be used in medicine. Could be used in, I'm thinking really hard. Can be used in all kinds of examples. That's another reason why it's a great selling photo. The other thing you have to think about is what, what's going on in the world right now? What season is it? What holiday is coming up? What, what are people doing right now or are about to be doing, I should say? So I'm not really a big sports person, but I'm guessing it's baseball season right about now or about to happen or soon to happen. I don't know. But all of a sudden, this one popped up on my list today as one of the top selling photos because there's probably a lot of baseball happening right now. And baseball is in focus, can be used for a lot of different reasons, baseball related, of course, sports related. But another reason why this is a great stock photo, and, and you're gonna hear this over and over and over again, is copy space. So yes, the focus is the baseball, we get it, we're on a baseball field, the background's out of focus, but what they've also done is by not cropping into just the baseball, they left me plenty of room as a marketer to add in copy. So if I'm looking for a photo to use in my flyer, to use in my upcoming baseball game, to use in my upcoming whatever, this, I could just use this as a background and put my copy right over the top of it. So that's another reason why that would be a good um, selling photo. Uh, just so I don't forget, the person that mentioned something about editorial content, Adobe Stock right now doesn't carry editorial. And what that means for those of you who are new, because this is for the basics, is that Let's say you take a picture of a famous uh, actor or actress. Um, I don't know, name someone. So first person that came to your mind, famous person. 
you, if we, once we do, or if we ever do allow editorial content, then that image can be sold for editorial purposes, meaning someone's doing a story about that famous person. That's what's, that's what's called editorial content. What that image can't be used for is selling your products and services. So if we ever get into licensing images for editorial uses, then that's when you'd be able to submit that famous person that you took at an event for use for telling stories about Robert De Niro. Okay, thanks. For telling stories about that person. Um, and that's different than models for being sold, used for commercial purposes. All right, Brad Pitt, got it. Okay, next up, uh, images like this. Now, this could be a photograph. It could be a, an effect. It could be something created in 3D. It could be a lot, it, however this was shot. What's making this a good photo is you get the feeling behind this right off the bat. It's wet. It's water. It's cool. It's refreshing. All of those things start to come to mind. And again, plenty of room for copy. So this could be used as a background. It could also be used as an image that's standalone as an image. Uh, images of people doing things. So not just good looking people or bad looking people for that matter, but people engaged in an activity is likely to be a good selling photo. So again, no model release needed for this one because we don't see their faces, but the couple things that's going on here. Number one, great photo because it's obviously they're in a meeting, they're doing stuff. Great photo number two, because there are people involved. Great photo number three, because they left me even a blank piece of paper to put something on. So they, they left me a couple of blank pieces of paper to put things on. So I can go in and put my own notes on all of these different pieces of paper, my own subliminal messaging for whatever it is I'm going to use this for. They didn't uh, violate any copyrights. It just says business. We don't know what paper that is. They may have even photoshopped that on there. Um, and again, just charts without any specific names makes this a better stock photo. Now, this one kind of got by because I know that's an Apple mouse. So sometimes the moderators don't catch everything, but that's an Apple mouse. I'm pretty sure of it because it doesn't have any buttons on the top. Yeah. So sometimes you get away with it, but I would not shoot for that. I also can pretty much tell that's an iMac here, but the rest of the stuff, that's an Apple keep. Well, okay. So... <laughs> This one probably shouldn't have got through, um, but it's a hot selling photo. Same thing, we're in the midst of spring. So, and this one's got an interesting aspect ratio. The other thing you might think about is if I'm going to use this for, um, or someone's gonna use this maybe for video, it being in that 16 by nine aspect ratio. I'm not saying that this is, cause it looks a little bit wider. But the aspect ratios could matter for people that are whatever, whatever you think they may use it for. So spring, plenty of copy space, good focus, not necessarily people related, but definitely a great selling, best selling image. All right, uh, we're almost out of time. Let me just see if I can find another example here that I want to use. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, we'll, we'll look at a couple of these. Let's look at this one. And okay, so you're, you're thinking, well, it didn't take much. I just photographed a bunch of leaves on the ground. You're right. The best selling photos aren't always the ones that took you to some fantastic location and some, you know, you, you had to set up a model shoot with, with six models and so forth and so on to do it. It could be as simple as a great fall background. That's what this is. Uh, it's beautiful colors. The leaves aren't even in the best shape, but it sells a lot because people just want a good background. All right, how about someone's house, uh, not famous? So for example, I had a house in here. If, um, if it's a recognizable property, meaning the property owner can recognize that property, then you're gonna need a property release. So there are model releases and property releases. So in order, like I was talking about the Space Needle, I would need a property release from them if I really wanted to sell that image. Same thing here, I would need a property release from the owner of this house. I'm gonna go out on a limb that the owner was probably either the photographer that took it or maybe even the person that built it or whatever, but they had the release or rights to do it. 
I, I this doesn't just doesn't look like someone was driving down the street. Oh, pretty house, click, and then took a picture of it because um, you wouldn't want your home being sold basically without your permission. The picture of your home, so that's why homes tend to need a model release. Can it be a composite? Can it be something you made? Absolutely. I, I, I'm going to go out on a limb that they did not catch a rainbow going into their pot of gold with all the stars going out. They kind of built this in Photoshop, even probably with the background. Uh, some of this may even look like it was built with 3D. Um, can you can you do that? Sure. There's nothing stopping you from making an image or using a graphic design. So you can absolutely do that. Uh, what about street photography photos? Well, street photography gets into that same thing. If I walk down and I see some cool graffiti, that's some artist's work. It, could, it doesn't matter if you will never know the artist or never find the artist, they didn't sign it, whatever. That's some artist's work. If you're talking about people in the street, yeah, that's fine as long as you don't see their faces and you don't, or you have their model releases. So street photography goes into that Depends on what it is that you actually photograph. Okay. Um, I think I answered that one. Let me see if I got any more real quick before I let you go. Dun, 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 dun. I think I caught them all, or the Adobe stock team has been catching the other ones. How much is the pay per download? Okay, we're going to get into that in more in the next one, but I can give it to you in a nutshell. Um, the person that submitted the image is going to get 33% of whatever it sells for. What does it sell for? That will vary depending on the person. Let's say I'm buying this image. If I just go to Adobe Stock and I'm not an Adobe customer and I just want to buy this image, that image is probably going to cost me $9.99. So you as a photographer or the person that built this, we get 33% of that. If I have a subscription where I, I get 10 images a month for 30 bucks, now I'm only paying $3 an image. So you get 33% of that. So it just really depends on the person buying it, how much they paid for it, you would get 33% of it. For videos, you get 35%. And if it sells with an extended license, which starts at $79, you get 33% of that. So it, it can go up depending on how it's being sold. But think of images. Graphic designs, 33%. Uh, videos, 35%. All right, what about photos mixed with vectors? No problem. You can have photos mixed with vectors. You can create anything you want and uh, sell it on stock, provided you follow the other rules that we already talked about. All right, how do I get the basic instruction for um, submitting um, stock photos? Well, I've actually created um, three videos that walk you through the whole process of uh, create or getting signed up as a contributor submitting your first image so forth and so on you can find those on my youtube channel at terrywhite.tv uh, and of course or just stay tuned to these streams where we're going to walk you through the whole process in the next two so just just to get you started just to get through the basics is what today was all about to kind of get you in that process so you can now go ahead and start creating those images that next week we'll show you how to actually start the process of signing up and submitting them and keywording and the importance of all those things as we go forward. So with that said, um, I wanna thank everyone for coming into this first session. Uh, this was again, more of a lecture than a how-to, but we're gonna definitely get into the actual how-tos starting next week and uh, finish up the week after. So stay tuned to this channel for the next stream that'll be scheduled and then we'll go on from there all right so with that said my time's up thanks everyone cheers and we'll catch you on the next one bye everybody